Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews with Christopher Brown. I am your host, Chris Brown, and today I am honored and pleased to have our guest in. He's the former Member of Parliament for the Riding of Essex in Ontario, Conservative Member of Parliament from 2004 to 2015, Mr. Jeff Watson. Jeff, thank you so much for being here. As we discuss conservatism in 2022, the path for it for provincial conservatism and the path for it for federal conservatism. So thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you. I'm uh, really pleased for the invitation. Glad to be here. So, Jeff, I, I told you the very first question that is always out of my mouth when I have a politician of any stature, any background, any uh, level of government on the show is where did your sense of duty to serve come from? I, I break it down, I think, in four things. It started with a dream uh, when I was a young kid. I think when uh, as far back as I can remember, I was eight years old. I was when other uh, boys were. Uh, riding their BMX bikes and turning dirt clods into concussion grenades. I used to sit in my room and dream about government, believe it or not. I don't know if that sounds crazy, but I, I always had a sense that there was something important. Um, next, I would say it was a belief. Um, you know, I began to develop the belief, I think, in my, uh, in my university years uh, when I started to get actively involved in, in politics and figuring out whether I was a conservative or what I was. Uh, the belief that um, our nation could do better, government could be better. Um, then a challenge from my mother of all people, uh, back when I was working on the assembly line at Chrysler and I uh, found myself complaining a lot to my mother's chagrin and she finally just said, you know, quit your bitching about it, why don't you do something? And I had the temerity to ask her what she thought I should do. She said, run for office. I don't think she actually meant it, mind you, but she did. Uh, she said it, and I took that as a bit of a catalyst to start thinking about uh, seriously about running. Uh, and then I would say a little bit later on, after I started running, I would say that uh, my faith commitment, um, you know, being a Christian, uh, service to others is an important part of that. And I think it added a depth uh, in my uh, 20s to the understanding that public service had um, a real call. It wasn't just about politics or, or other things like that. So I think I've always been focused on uh, those issues. I, I'll, I'll tell you, it was interesting. I came uh, to discover, I appreciated the Conservative Party back at the time of Meech Lake and uh, the Charlottetown Accord. And it was the fundamental question of the relationship in Confederation. Um, something wasn't right. Uh, you know, Quebec was uh, not a signatory to the you know, the, the, the constitutional agreement back in 1982. So what did that mean? Uh, that was all new to me to discover. Uh, later, Charlottetown, of course, when Elijah Harper, uh, for example, stood on his feet in the House of Commons and said, hey, where's a pathway towards self-government uh, for Indigenous peoples? Uh, those were provocative questions. And I admit I didn't have all the answers, but I, I was attracted to the idea of trying to deal uh, with things that were uh, big like that. These are these are fundamental relationship questions uh, in our nation, and of course, uh, they, they're you know the indigenous question particularly is a question still today that doesn't have a full resolution to it. But I think we're a lot further down the road than we were uh, back then on the question of reconciliation, which is good a good direction to be headed. More to be done. And we're going to talk a lot about some of the big issues that are facing Canada right now, and even particularly, as I said in the introduction, the conservative movement in Canada, and yep. in particular in some of the provinces. But I, 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 I love asking this next question to any uh, politician who has been elected federally, because I, I have never had the ability to walk on the House of Commons floor as an elected member of parliament, but you have. You have had the ability to walk on that floor and dictate and direct the will of the government to affect day-to-day -day lives of every Canadian citizen from St. John's to Victoria to Iqaluit. What was that experience like for the very first time walking on that floor of the House of Commons? Because I, I, I haven't had it. You are one of thousands of Canadians who've had that opportunity. Yeah. Uh, interesting story, actually. It, it wasn't at the beginning of a session. We had uh, uh, been elected in the, uh, the beginning of summer in 2004. And uh, actually, it was Diane Finley, who was a member of parliament from southwestern Ontario and later served in multiple capacities in the Harper government as a minister. 
uh, who had this idea that we should maybe as a group do a, a swearing in as Ontario MPs. So we came up for a swearing in event. And then of course, uh, came the experience while I was there. I thought, well, I should, now that I can go out on the floor, maybe I should. And uh, it was a little after hours, but the security opened the doors for me. And I remember walking in past the um, past the brass bar where others are only allowed to go to and actually onto the floor. And I'm looking up at this, uh, this uh, majestic uh, chamber. And, um, you know, you begin to think about um, this great connectivity with the past. I mean, I'm now standing on a floor that our first Prime Minister, Johnny McDonald, uh, stood on. Wilfrid Laurier at the turn of the century. I mean, I began to think about all these prime ministers. A, a Windsor boy, Paul Martin, was just about to take uh, his uh, lead of the government at that time in, in 2004. So, um, you know, that was that's pretty amazing. And now I'm standing there um, with this great opportunity, uh, hopefully to make uh, an improvement in the direction, not only of the nation, but do some important things for our region, which needed it. Um, and then I um, and then I looked down from looking up and I realized that almost all the benches were gone because they had cleared them out for the summer to reconfigure the seats and of course rewire for all the modern electronics. So I, I, I wasn't able to go find my seat and uh, and go sit at it and take a picture. So it was an interesting experience, this great this great sense of wow, and then okay, well, <laughs> here's the reality, it's being rewired. <laughs> you said something that I want to just follow up on quickly before we switch gears here is wow. that wow factor. Did, wow. That go, did that go away? You served in office for 11 years. Did that ever go away? Or every time you walked on that floor, did you always have that sense of wow, I'm here because the people of Essex put me here and I'm here to do the best job I can to make sure that they represent it correctly and Canadians' lives are better because I am here to make sure their lives are better. Yeah, it doesn't get old, I can tell you that. <laughs> um, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you another, you know, anecdotally, I, um, every time I left through the member's door, uh, exiting uh, center block, uh, I would always look up at the flag over the peace tower. You know, I had to look pretty at a, at a pretty high angle being that, that almost directly under the peace tower itself. And I would catch my breath, literally. I don't know how many times I, I get that sensation. Ooh, I had to kind of catch my breath. This is amazing, um, amazing thing to be a part of. And in the end, I think, you know, I, I, we did a credible job. I thought our government did a decent job of, of navigating some very difficult times, the Great Recession, in fact, the greatest one since the Great Depression. Um, we did some significant things for my region. I did earn the nickname from uh, a journalist who used to consider himself part of the liberal re-election machine down in Windsor. He called me the billion dollar MP by the end of it. So we, um, we did uh, score some significant investment along the way that helped propel our region forward. And you can see the fruits of that, I think, in Windsor, Essex today still, uh, especially with the new Gordie Howe Bridge getting closer to completion. Uh, between Windsor and Detroit, that's going to be a, an important milestone in a couple more years when that's uh, open to the public and there's a, um, a truck bypass around the city of Windsor that will keep that uh, trade route flowing freely for a long time to come. Well, I thank you for answering those questions, but I yeah. want to dive into the meat and potatoes of this episode, and that is sure. the conservative movement. Um, before I get into the uh, the actual crux of the uh, interview, I, I guess I should ask the question: What does conservatism mean to you, Jeff Watson? Ah, that's always a good question. I the the beauty of being a conservative in in a way is that we get to self identify um, as conservatives, right? Uh, that's you know where do my values kind of square in? And it doesn't matter what region you're in. There is some regional variation, obviously. There's some philosophical variation that exists. Um, I always remind people that we're a coalition, right? Uh, as every political party is, we're not monolithic. So when I look at where my values align, I think I'm a democratic conservative. I'd love to see more decentralization, if you will, of, of um, our institutional power. Uh, that's what attracted me about the Reform Party uh, back in the 90s. Um, even though I was from, well, I was on the periphery in terms of the nation down in the Windsor area. And, um, you know, uh, Toronto and Ottawa were very much the center of power and not always in a positive way for our region. So that attracted me. Uh, fiscal conservative, I think it's important that we balance budgets, that we 
um, you know, that we are able to um, ensure that our taxes are lower, not higher. Um, that doesn't mean we don't have taxes. Obviously, public services have to be paid for, but we need to find that sweet spot where uh, the government is focused, it does the things it needs to be doing, um, and looks at alternatives where others can play a role. Um, and I would say, I, you know, I fit into the realm, but my voting record shows that I was a social conservative, I think, when it came to uh, big issues in our nation, uh, particularly being pro-life. Um, that was an area where I felt that I had a voice uh, to talk about and a vote when those issues came up uh, in the chamber. I never made them the uh, solitary focus of what I did, right? People have, you have to govern and a government deals with a whole range of issues, uh, but I was able to contribute uh, in, in those types of ways. So, um, you know, I think I'm a full spectrum conservative, if you will. Others may find that they're, you know, they, they align with some aspects and not others. Uh, but we all get to say we're conservatives and the key for us is how do we figure out as a party and that is on issues of uh, choosing a leader um, it's how we uh, function as a party and uh, function as a government uh, if we have the privilege of government how do we find the things that unite us and how do we manage our differences uh, in a professional way that allows us uh, to be uh, competent when it comes to the question of government for the nation um, I I covered politics back in Ontario for a long period of time, and I worked on uh, Parliament Hill for a few months. I shouldn't say a few years because I was just an upstart reporter, and they told me to go where I was told. But I was there when Stephen Harper was Prime Minister. So during your time in office, Stephen Harper was able to keep the coalition together, was yes. able to bring the coalition and unify the party with Peter McKay with the Progressive Conservatives and the Canadian Alliance, and then win power in 2006. And then in 2015, you would be the first to know as well, the uh, Conservatives lost, Liberals won, and the coalition seems to start falling apart at this time. With the rise of the People's Party of Canada under Maxime Bernier, the rise of the Maverick Party under Jay Hill, out here in Western Canada. I, I know we laugh about that, but they are a factor from time to time in some writings. So we need to address them from time to time. Is the coalition fractured beyond repair? Or can this leadership race that we're currently in, because we've seen Andrew Shear try to keep that coalition together. We've seen Aaron O'Toole try to keep that coalition together. But is this leadership race that we're currently in the 2022, which will be electing a new leader in September. Are we going to see a more fractured party, or are we going to see a more co, uh, a bigger, a better coalition than we've seen in the past two elections with the Conservatives? Do you think? I think um, the the coalition is never beyond repair. Let me just start there. I, I think um, if you look at the broad, take the long range picture of this in terms of Canadian history, Conservative parties have united and governed and then fractured or fragmented and then they come back together. So there's there's a bit of a history here. It's not a recent history, uh, if you will. Uh, sometimes uh, the party itself needs a bit of reform. That's what happened in the 90s, right, with the coalition. So, uh, and then with the unity in 2004, I think we maintained the best aspects of the two legacy uh, parties at the time. And then we provided a platform by which we could govern. The key is always our unity. Um, and I think uh, leadership plays some role in that. I don't want to overstate the role that Stephen Harper played in bringing the coalition together and how he managed it. There's a model there. We can talk about that shortly if you want to break that down a little bit about how do you, um, you know, how do you keep a caucus uh, united? There's a there's a very good model there. It's one I think that Pierre Poilievre will know because, uh, you know, he served in caucus as well, served in cabinet. Um, but our, our unity precipitates our capacity to govern. So leadership will be a part of that. I think members have to make some decisions too. Are they in, are they out? Um, uh, depending on some of these questions. I'm a movement conservative, so I'm not going anywhere, if you will. I, I'm, not, uh, you know, I, I'm not adopting in uh, temporarily uh, on a particular iteration of, of the party or not. So movement conservatives, I think we stay for the long haul. Others will have to decide um, whether what comes of this leadership race is sufficient for them. But um, 
I think usually what, if, let's talk about the Harper model since I brought it up. I, I think what uh, Stephen Harper succeeded in doing, uh, one was focusing an, uh, an agenda on the items uh, of conservative unity. I would say in that coalition or that iteration of the coalition, probably 70 to 75% of that agenda were things that conservatives could agree with. Uh, but he also had a way internally of managing our differences without it spilling out into the media. There were structured ways of looking at how do some of uh, the parts of our coalition get um, issues that matter to them. Uh, take, for example, social conservatives, um, the issue of funding or defunding international abortion, for example, is something uh, not a... Um, not a major domestic issue, if you will, but it was something appealing to uh, social conservatives. So there was a there was a way to look at some of those items and say, okay, well, there's a win for you. Um, those who are fiscally conservative and socially liberal, there were other ways of dealing with that. So Stephen Harper, I think, very much looked at those. He was an incrementalist by nature, anyway, but I think he looked at structural ways of saying, well, how do we on the things we disagree with, you know. Some parts of our coalition will get a win and other parts will get a win. And I think in the end, that was a successful model. Um, I think the second thing in terms of caucus unity anyway, is, is our ability to, to, uh, to sort of self-adopt a, a professional way forward. Um, I, I'll give you one example. I, I took very seriously that um, issues, for example, where I felt I had a lot of freedom to talk about in my district. Uh, weren't necessarily issues that, um, you know, could be, um, that would have the same freedom for a colleague of mine in another district. So sometimes I sort of self-policed and said, well, you know, and I'm not going to speculate about a certain issue uh, because it may have ramifications for someone else. So, it, you know, it may be, um, you know, it may be permissible, but not necessarily beneficial. So there's a self-discipline that enters uh, where you just sort of say, okay, look, I need to, I need to focus myself. Um, and channel myself into productive ways for for the for the caucus and for the coalition too, right? Now, and I apologize for interrupting. I just want to oh, jump, in, jump in on that question, that statement yeah. that you just said about unity. Earlier this week, earlier last week, after when this is airing, so it'd be last week in the last part of June. Um, right. Michelle Rempel Gardner, the MP for Calgary Nose Hill, wrote a letter basically saying she's out of the UCP leadership race. This is the reason why. In that, she talked about unity as well and how the conservative movement is facing a challenge on its hands with people backstabbing, releasing audio tapes, doing all this backhanded stuff. And this is one person's account. So I can't say if it's true or not, but Stephen, uh, right. when I was a reporter back in Ontario, I remember getting stuff out of the Stephen Harper government was like pulling teeth sometimes because there was such a lockdown and unity of we have one message, we have one cohesive message going forward, and we're going to do it for the best of Canada. The What we're seeing right now, whether it be here provincially in Alberta, whether it be federally, the Conservatives are still trying to figure out what unity looks like in 2022 compared to 2015 or 26 to 2015. Would you agree with that statement? Well, let me let me unpack Stephen Harper for a moment. I want to take exception to the idea that there was a lockdown of information. Well, uh, you can't possibly control every aspect of communications, but I think what he asked of us was a buy-in for some discipline, right? And we had to make a decision, do, do I opt into something like that? And this is sort of what I'm talking about. Um, you know, I uh, be circumspect about the, the things you think and what you want to talk about. Uh, that doesn't mean that we, you know, don't talk about things that are important, but um, but there's there's a circumspection there, or professionalism, I, I guess I'd say. I can't I can't comment on the Michelle Rempel um, uh, picture of where caucus is at today. Obviously, I don't sit in caucus anymore. Um, but, um, you know, I, I, I would hope that... Um, but you I must agree that, that there is more of a... Let's talk to the media in more of a off-the-record, wink-wink, nudge-nudge way that the Conservatives are doing, because we saw it with Aaron O'Toole when the Freedom Convoy started. And I apologize for... We're, we're jumping around right now, and no, I do apologize. Good. I don't mind. But I, I like this conversation because I, I start with one conversation. We see where the tangent takes us. Yeah. We saw that 
we had conservatives come out saying Aaron O'Toole with Bob Benzie, the MP for here in Calgary, uh, say he doesn't have support. Like, it just wouldn't seem like yeah. something that would have happened in the Stephen Harper years, because like you said, Stephen Harper had the buy-in of caucus. He said, let, to be honest, some of them did leave and cross the floor, but for the majority of the time. Well, and we kicked Garth Turner out too, right? <laughs> Well, let's be honest, Garth Turner, I don't think Garth knew what Garth Turner was in. So where he was, that's my personal opinion on Garth Turner. Uh, um, is unity the big issue with the Conservative Party? Because if you don't have a unified party, and the Liberals have always been seen to be like great at this, unify, win, and then we'll complain while we're in government. But until we win, we can't do that. The Conservatives have a better, a odder moment, in my opinion, where they'll unify when they're in government, but until they get to government, it seems like, okay, we need to win. And no matter how we win, I don't care. So let's win and then we'll unify. But until then, our goal is yeah. to win and that's it. And that's I, I outside of perspective. I, I think the last seven years there's been a lot of conversation on what it takes to win the, the electability question. I actually think that's a distraction. Um, history shows clearly that when we are unified, we we earn the right to govern, right? And our agenda can become clearer, um, and uh, you know, not be clouded by I think some of the other distraction I think the winability question is almost like happiness right if you're if you're pursuing happiness you may never attain it it's that elusive thing uh, winability almost has a little bit of that because everybody has a different idea and I'm not sure that winability um, I don't obsess about it I think as much as leaders do but um, I think I think when we're unified and can present a professional face and a competent agenda you earn the right uh, to govern um, that's, I think, what history shows about the conservative movement. Now, don't 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 think that other parties uh, have the bee's knees on this either. I remember Paul Martin stalking Jean Chrétien for a long time. There was a lot of leaking and bloodletting, and he eventually had his way, pushing uh, pushing him out the door. So it, it happens in all parties, um, for sure. But I, I think we're in a bit of a vacuum. Stephen Harper was a big presence for us uh, nationally, and so filling that with what we are next or who we are next, if you will, to a degree is part policy and it's part leadership. Um, I feel bad for Andrew Scheer because the leaking, I think really uh, undercut his ability. I thought he had, I thought he deserved a chance increasing the popular vote and uh, holding the liberals to a minority he deserved a chance to prove himself a little further. Others disagreed. So there was a little bit of knifing that went on there, but uh, Aaron O'Toole was a different question. I think Aaron's in, Aaron was in search of a different voter coalition, right? Every party ours, uh, has always relied on a three-legged stool for a while, like in the Mulroney years, for example, that third leg was Quebec nationalism, that once the bloc was created, that was no longer there. Um, and I think I think he was wanting to see us become a party of the big cities. I don't know that for sure, because we never had a conversation about it, but I suspect that's where he was aiming. Um, the Harper Coalition, I think, is what um, probably uh, Andrew Shear was sort of the, the representative of at the time maintaining that, that kind of an idea. This race will be very interesting because, um, you know, I, I think beneath the service, nobody's really, um, uh, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what, what each of the candidates think the voter coalition uh, looks like. I mean, with Jean Charest, we have him, uh, to borrow a Churchillian phrase, he's sort of re-ratting, if you will, back to um, where he started. He was a progressive conservative. Uh, federally, and now he's coming back to seek the leadership. Who, who is he trying to bring into that, um, into the coalition? Maybe that's not there. Uh, Pierre, I think Polyev, who's uh, by all um, accounts the probably the presumptive favorite um, in in the race, or certainly it's his to lose. I think um, is attracting a lot of people who haven't necessarily had allegiance to a political party. That's an interesting story, uh, talking about housing affordability and things like that. I think he's reaching a young demographic um, in, some, in some very important ways by speaking to issues that are concerning them. So this will be very interesting to see what the, the coalition emerges like from the leadership discussion um, and, wh and whether, whether there's a buy-in from enough people to say this is probably a direction we need to go. 
why 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 wasn't it there beforehand because we we talk about unity and needing the unity of a government uh, party it seemed like on the superficial surface andrew Shear had a unified party going into the 2019 election the 2021 election aaron o'toole started with a unified party and then it seemed to have some issues when guns came up are conservatives harder on their leader than other parties? Ah, I don't know, because I've never been in another <laughs> uh, another political party, if you will, that way, uh, other than conservative parties. But uh, I, I will say, um, I think conservatives take their politics very seriously. Um, you know, they're, um, we're the type of people who will divide ourselves on a comma and a clause at a at a convention debating policy or constitutional amendments. So uh, there, is some, there is some individualism too, I think that really is, um, is embedded in our DNA. We're not as collectivist as for example, left-wing parties will be. So, um, you know, the centrifugal force uh, against unifying is, is sort of that individualism. Um, so we, we have to find ways to, how do how do we find that sweet spot? But, um, but so that, I think some of our nature is part of that question of, of can we unify? But you um, talked about that, individuality, and I want to jump yeah, on yeah. that for a second here because to win, you have to unify the movement, the conservative movement. But the the conservative movement right now, if you go talk to somebody in Nova Scotia who's a conservative card carrying member, and yeah. then you go talk to someone here in Alberta. Then you go talk to someone in Lower Mainland BC. Their idea of what a conservative a conservative is is going to be completely different. Now, I, I wouldn't say it's completely different. We'll have a lot in common, but there we'll may be some there may be some variations. That's what I meant. I do apologize for that. You are correct. There are some variations. How do you unify a coalition of a country around a conservative stance? when the variations of conservatism, the further you go east or west, is different. Yeah, well, we've proven we, in the past we've done this before. So I, again, I, um, leadership will play part of that question. Um, our ability to agree on a, on, on a competent agenda that not only keeps us focused on things we agree on, but finds ways to address the other ones. Um, that will, those, I think those two things are going to be sort of paramount. And then again, I think those who are conservatives are going to have to take a look at the product that's coming out of this and say, are we in or are we not in too, right? So I, I, I don't know how you, I don't know how you pull it all together uh, in that way with so many, uh, so many individual parts to, um, you know, and so many different roles to play here. But, uh, but I think that's the, I think those are the two biggest things and i'm you know by unity i'm not i'm not talking about a phony unity either this idea that we'll just you know kumbaya our way through it um you know we have to we have to come to grips i think with what our what our ultimate policy aim will be who are we trying to speak to and um you know do we have the kind of leadership that can that can speak to that uh, will we have discipline and professionalism as a caucus um so that our message is not distracted by other things there are a lot of pieces to that puzzle that have to come into place. I saw them come together in the Harper years. Um, you know, can we do it again? And I think we can. You, you talked about the Harper years, and I want to know, because Harper kept on winning more seats as his time went on. 24, 2004, he won more seats. 2006, he won a minority government. 2008, 2011, he won his majority government. Um, you were there the whole time, so I don't need to tell you that. But for my listeners, you might be listening for from in Australia yeah. for some reason. They might not know that. Um, I, I want to know, how did Stephen Harper and what lessons can the front runners of this leadership race in 2022 with the Conservative uh, Party learn from the coalition that was created under Stephen Harper to win his majority government in 2011? Because Stephen Harper's challenge in 2011 was to win in downtown Toronto, which was very a liberal safe haven, win in Montreal, which was yet again a liberal safe haven. Um, it went NDP in Quebec, but that's a whole nother story with Jack Layton. But what can 
the lessons of 2011 and that coalition that Stephen Harper was able to bring together be brought forward into 2022 or potentially 2025 when the anticipated next election is going to happen. Yeah. Um, remember too that Stephen Harper, um, you know, in moving from opposition minority to majority government, uh, in a way had to earn the trust of the public in his in his capacity uh, to lead. So I think increasingly um, they grew to trust him. I, in the beginning, there was all the you know hidden agenda talk and things like that, if you'll remember. And uh, so we had, we had to earn our way. I think our professionalism, our focus, and our discipline. Um, uh, helped uh, uh, helped us, I think, earn greater confidence with the public. I think our agenda was also simple to understand, even though government is complex, but our messages, um, certainly in the earlier days, were, were very simple. We started with five priorities, uh, if you'll remember. It didn't mean we didn't have uh, things to speak to on other things, but we had a conversation with people that was simple to understand. They knew what we were going to do, uh, and then we did it. I think that was the other part of it is the credibility uh, on the on the backside of it. But um, you know what Stephen Harper, I think his leadership produced over time was a professional, uh, competent government. Um, big events, I think, to a degree helped them. The downturn in two thousand and eight. I think people had the sense that um, an adult was in the room when uh, G twenty meetings were happening, for example. Um, that there was a steady hand and things like that. Um, ultimately, I think fatigue did him in, but had it not, I, I don't see any reason why uh, at that point we still didn't have, um, you know, a kind of presentation that Canadians uh, could lay hold of um, had it been earlier in a cycle. So I think, um, I think with the next leader, uh, whoever that will be, um, there's a few things that will be important. One, I think we have to have an honest discussion about how much wilderness time do we want, <laughs> right? Fragmentation can be uh, a deliberate choice if you want to pursue it and you could make that last a long time. Um, secondly, the ability of whatever this current caucus will be um, to be disciplined, I think will be important. Can we stay focused? Can we keep the public focused on um, Justin Trudeau's government, right? Governments don't uh, get beaten, they defeat themselves. So how do we ensure that, um, you know, we are cohesively um, keeping that message front and center with people um, and not distracting them with our own internal antics? A caucus will play a big role in that. Um, and where ultimately we settle on the question of a platform, uh, next election, what are we going to put forward and say with our, our leadership we're going to do? Will it be simple? Can it be understandable? Um, and will it speak to the priorities um, that people are asking us to, uh, to consider? So I think those things will matter. One thing that I've always prided myself on on this show, and particularly when I ever talk to politicians, is talking talking with people who might not agree with you 100%. Now, Stephen Harper, I, I, I wasn't there, you were there, so I, I'm going to ask you the question. Did he talk to politicians across the aisle? Because we see in today's society with Justin Trudeau, he's very much, if you're a liberal, I'll talk to you. If you're not, we don't want to have anything to do with you. Canadians are looking for, and you, you said it so eloquently at the beginning of the interview, the adult in the room. They're looking for someone who can actually have a conversation, not just with people that you support that support you, but people who you may disagree with, whether it be Justin Trudeau and the Freedom Convoy, whether it be Stephen Harper and the First Nations communities with the uh, uh, hunger strike on the steps of Parliament Hill. Are, are Canadians expecting too much of their politicians to actually have an adult conversation with everyone and not just the people that they support or that support them? I I think the short answer is no, it's not unrealistic, but- um, The long in, answer in, is? <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a practical sense, there are two things to consider, I think. One is um, when you're elected on a platform, there is some expectation that you're going to fulfill commitments that you put in, in front of people. Uh, where Stephen Harper, I think, um, showed flexibility were on the issues that required larger consensus. 
when we were looking at um, a combat mission in Afghanistan, for example, shifting the focus of that. Um, you know, discussion with the Liberals, I think, at the time was an important part of, of ensuring that we had more than just uh, um, more than just our, our party on side, if you will, as the government. Is there more of a consensus around some big issues like that? So, uh, you know, he did have that ability. He certainly had the expectation that as members of cabinet um, and even parliamentary secretaries, I served for a couple of years as a, on the assisting on the transport and infrastructure file with uh, Lisa Ray. The expectation was that we would have a lot of conversations with our counterparts. Uh, when we were addressing the issue of rail safety uh, in the aftermath of Lac Megantic, um, that, was in, it, that, was, uh, that was paramount for us to ensure that we were having um, some buy-in. There was a lot of collegiality on the steps uh, forward to improve rail safety in our country. So. I think we did some of that um, on, on the issues where we needed to have a greater buy-in. But in a practical sense, um, I don't know that um, er, you know, every, uh, every item on the agenda or, or most of the items on agenda can be, uh, can be a sort of consensus-based, if you will. So, um, but I think on, on, on the important ones, we need to have that broader input, I think, from, from parties. The reason I ask that is because I, 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 I'm a political observer. I follow politics like people follow that NASCAR and wrestling, all that. I, I watch, I watch oral questions every day almost because that's what that's what my entertainment is at 11:30 in Mountain Standard Time or 12:30 Mountain Standard Time. Yeah. The decorum that I see in that House of Commons today is so atrocious that I would not want to be serving in that parliament. You, you were there. Conservatives were able to keep the decorum civil. Yes, there were some times where people would get out of hand and yell things across. And we all know the famous flipping of the bird from Justin Trudeau to, I think it was Peter Kent. Uh, but there was some civility when conservatives are in power. Can the conservatives move, movement move that back? Because we're seeing right now with the conservative opposition, theatrics, and that's just my outside looking in on this situation. Would, what's your opinion on the state of the conservative opposition of today when it comes to dealing with Justin Trudeau's liberal government? Um, uh, decorum in the house is always interesting. Anybody who's ever watched the mother parliament for question period will know it gets, uh, <laughs> it gets pretty, uh, I wouldn't say bawdy, but it certainly gets uh, it, it, it gets raucous for sure. Uh, look, we had our share of heckling uh, that went on um, back in the day too, including with conservatives. Um, you know, speakers had to intervene to keep order in the house. I think, uh, you know, I, I remember as a rookie uh, back in the uh, um, uh, back in uh, I think it was 2005. I challenged Paul Martin to a fight out back of the house of Commons, uh, sort of indirectly, but. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I, his deputy prime minister on uh, deflecting questions on, uh, on the Gomery affair made some uh, crazy statement that we all write uh, these very uh, quaint letters to uh, other people's spouses. Uh, uh, this is about one of the principal ad scammers at the time. And I rose to my feet and said, if the prime minister ever wrote a letter like that to my uh, wife, I would have him out back of this house pretty quick. And so they had to restore order after that. We apologize, but so we have moments like that, I think. But, but it, I, I think it more to your to point more is, often there is than... a deterioration, right? And, yeah. and the, I think in the caliber of it, right? I remember a, a New Democrat MP who got elbowed, if you will, uh, by the Prime Minister. Uh, there, there's a degree that's a little bit different, I think, than back in the day. Look, leadership does set some tone. Stephen Harper was professional in the House. He expected it, uh, especially when we were the government. Um, he wanted discipline from us in, in the question period uh, atmosphere so that our messages could be heard, understood, not interrupted all the time. Jack Layton was very good at it too with his own caucus. Um, he expected a lot of discipline from, uh, from his members at the time. So it wasn't just that the Conservatives were maintaining a degree of decorum uh, in the House back then. Um, but uh, I, there's been a general degradation, I think, in the discourse of politics. Uh, there's uh, polarization goes a long way to that. 
um, I think there's a, a deeper discussion to have here. I think, um, you know, almost a generation ago by design, the activist left has, uh, has for its own um, gains, if you will, really polarized the spectrum. I think conservatives in the last seven years, um, and I mean that by small c, uh, conservatives have uh, groups aligned with uh, the conservative values uh, have sprung up to play some of the same game. And I think the, or use the same tactics, I would say it's not a game, but um, have responded in similar tactics now. And I think that divide is, is coming a little further apart. Um, uh, you know, that polarization, I think that the activist left began um, has really led to a demonization or a dehumanization, I think, even of politicians. So if you're, um, everybody is extreme if you're a conservative and, and um, you know, now the extremity is even more extreme. And then, you know, the extreme extreme are now even more extreme. And it, it doesn't really serve to offer much, I think, in terms of a bridging point. We are human beings. Um, you know, we have as much care and concern as conservatives for the big issues of the day. We do have disagreement about how we get there sometimes, um, but uh, we've lost the art of the conversation. I think some of that seeps into questions like decorum in the house too. And look, if you're vilifying each other all the time um, and not seeing the humanity in each other, how do we how do we how do we dial that back or bring it back in? So, so I am concerned. I think generally speaking, with this um, with this sort of polarization that's been going on, it's corrosive in the end um, uh, to to questions of consensus. So. Um, which which brings up the question because this it's my long way of asking we have seen a more polarized leadership race in 2022 for the conservative party of canada than we have seen in 2017 and 2020 with aaron o'toole and andrew Shear winning we, yeah. we we just talked about polarization can the can the party come together after this and be unified because we're seeing, and yet again, this is this is all public knowledge, so you probably have seen it as well. Pierre Polyev's team calling John Charest not a conservative because he was a Quebec liberal. We have former BC liberals endorsing Pierre Polyev, but that's okay. It seems like we are more, <laughs> more in this situation with the conservatives where if you're not on my team, you're bad, and I'm going to call you out for everything you've ever done. So that turns off the supporters of other people, which you need to have to win a coalition, to win the next government. Yeah. The polarization that we're seeing right now, is this detrimental to the Conservative Party of Canada? Or is this just what it is in 2022 to be in politics, the polarization that we see? I, I hope it's not. Uh, when, <laughs> Me too. Because you know, we're just in 2022, right? <laughs> I mean, uh, no, I uh, look, contrast is one thing. Um, you know, you always want to, you always sort of want to have contrast, including about your opponents. But, um, you know, deep polarization concerns because it has corrosive effects. So I don't, I don't actually know where we're going to land after this leadership race um, is concluded. Um, but, um, you know, I, I, I take note of what you're saying uh, in terms of the, there's a bit of acrimony. Um, I think some of that acrimony is, um, uh, is sort of posturing. Some of it may actually be real. I don't know. Um, you know, I don't, I don't feel the same way. Look, I left, I left the PC party federally when Jean Charest was the leader. Uh, he's the reason I went to the reform party, but I don't have personal animus toward him. Um, you know, I don't know what leadership would be like with him in this current iteration, although I think his time as a, as a Liberal Premier will have some indication about some of the things, um, you know, he might do as a leader. But, um, you know, I think, um, boy, I, I, I just I hope we dial it back. <laughs> I hope we dial it back. Whoever the leader is will have to make some important overtures um, uh, to uh, the other parts of the coalition when it's done. Are you concerned as an outsider watching your former party go through this leadership race that parties like the People's Party of Canada under Maxime Bernier and the Maverick Party under Colin Krieger, a former Jay Hill, your former uh, caucus colleague, 
could see a rise in their memberships and the conservative movement even fracture even further. Because you talk about how the conservatives fracture after government usually, and then they unify right before they win. They unify to win, but beforehand they go through a period where they see a little bit of separation, whether it be the social credit in the 60s and 70s, and then the 80s, you saw Mulroney win, you saw the reform of the Canadian Alliance and the PCs in the 90s, and then unifying under the Conservative Party. Is this just a moment in time where the PCs, uh, the Conservatives and the PPCs are a little bit divided right now, but ultimately they'll come together at the end of the day and they will win. It's just finding that leader who can galvanize that coalition again. Well, remember that uh, if you look at the last election, it's actually splits in the, in the left um, that gave us more seats than splits between us uh, and the PPC. So let's not overstate uh, the question a little bit. Um, you know, Justin Trudeau's greater success in terms of seat counts came when progressives united behind him rather than splitting between parties yeah. uh, in a different breakout than they have. So they have their own issues about, you know, coalition of support to, to, to address that are, that are direct, uh, uh, that draw a direct line uh, to their success or, or lack of success. For us, look, um, the PPC is interesting. Um, it's Max's party. They, they, don't, they don't have a constitution. It's not a member-driven party per se. So what Max is thinking on any given day, I don't really know. Or does he think about the, the question of, of unity on any terms with the CPC? I don't know. Uh, but uh, And I always said this too, in terms of the PPC's growth, um, I, there, there's room for growth for the PPC that I think... Um, uh, directly correlates to how much we agree with Justin Trudeau as the Conservative Party of Canada. I think the more we agree with his agenda, the more room we create for the PPC uh, to grow its membership and its popularity. But uh, look, uh, everything starts with us. We were the vehicle that was created for unity to unify Conservatives back in 2004. Um, I hope our leadership recognizes that um, and takes seriously a question of what we present that will unify us uh, coming out of this leadership race and beyond. I, I want to turn to a provincial race now, if you're okay with talking about that. Sure. That is the leadership of the United Conservative Party. They, wow. Jason Kenney stepped down. We see nine people, eight people confirmed. Nine people uh, have put their name forward. And Raj me. Sherman is in. That's the ninth <laughs> person. I, a PC turned liberal, turned Alberta Party, turned United Conservative Party. I guess anyone can run at this time. Um, Flavor of the month. There we go. But hey, Raj, if you want to come on the show, come on and we'll talk about your leadership. Yeah. And I'm happy to have you on. Um, unif unification is one of these things that we, 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 we've taught. This has been the theme throughout this episode, yeah. which is unity, 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 which is true. Yeah. And it's in their name, the United Conservative Party. That's where we started anyway. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, and that's what I want to know. You're, you live in Alberta yeah. now, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. I think I can say that correctly without being uh, uh, attacked yeah. here. But you, you, you moved from Ontario to Alberta, just like I did. I moved from Ontario to Alberta. Um, yeah. You're seeing this play out now. Is this going to be yeah. a more mellow race, in your opinion, compared to what we're seeing federally with the attacks? Because unifying the one province's conservative movement is a much different aspect than move, unifying a federal conservative movement, isn't it? Yeah, I, I, I would say this was going to be a sleepy race, except for I think Danielle Smith has sort of um, uh, come out of the gate in a very, um, a very forceful way, I think, taking some very strong and clear positions that set her apart from the rest of the field. So we'll see whether uh, whether it gets spicy down the road, but uh, I don't think there's personal acrimony there. And I think um, the unity we started with in, um, in in putting this together, and I participated, I was on the senior leadership team when I came to Alberta in 2016 um, through 2017, that whole process of Unite Alberta and creating the UCP and then the leadership of Jason Kenney. I think where we started um, and what we've seen in terms of fracturing, the fracturing, I think, has been more related to um, the outgoing leader. Um, you know, what I've learned being in Alberta, trust is a real important commodity um, or currency. I don't want to say commodity, a currency in politics. 
you give your word on something, Albertans expect you to follow through on it. Um, and when we don't really know what your word is from one day to another, that 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 I think that erodes um, erodes the trust factor. I think that's more what we were looking at in terms of some of the fragmentation. I think it's probably why this won't be an acrimonious race because I don't think the players themselves um, have a lot uh, have a tremendous amount of disagreement on issues and don't have personal animus to each other. So we'll probably see a very tame version of this. Um, that doesn't mean that there aren't questions about where the ur urban rural vote will go, right? Uh, you know, who will they come behind? Can a candidate really command sort of the, um, the regional variations of the party really well? Um, well, it remains to be seen, but I, I don't think this is gonna look anything like um, the race we're seeing federally for the CPC. So the reason I asked the we, we I pivot to the provincial is because the goal for the leadership of the uh, like if you win the leadership of the UCP leadership election you are premier of Alberta. Yes. You you, you they're like the ultimate goal is you will be premier of Alberta. The leadership of the Conservative Party is you are leader of the official opposition. So you were stuck in opposition. One of the candidates is running for prime minister, right? <laughs> <laughs> that, that, well, that's true. That's very true. Prime there minister. Go, yeah. But ultimately, he will be leader right. of the official opposition for right. two to three years or however long this supply right. management agreement between the NDP and the Liberals right. last. Right. Is it easier, do you think, and you are you talked about it a little bit beforehand, but I want to get a little bit more in depth here, is because the stakes are a little bit higher for the UCP, and you need to come off as a premier in waiting during this leadership raise. Is it going to be less uh, strenuous on attacks against each other? And okay, we may disagree on a little bit of policy here and there, but I'm not going to attack your character or you're not conservative enough like you're seeing in the provincial because or federal because federally you're, you're literally running to be leader of the official opposition for a few years. Yeah, I, I don't know how that's going to fact. I, I suspect people, um, uh, candidates are probably considering um, what, uh, um, you know, what their image is going to look like as they are, you know, the professionalism of their campaign. But like I said, I think the bigger factor uh, is that there's no real personal acrimony between, uh, between the members themselves. So I think you'll see, I think you'll see a tame race. I think you'll see uh, some clear lines um, on policy. We're seeing that with Danielle Smith and some of the rest of the field by contrast. I, just, I expect more of that will happen. Um, and then, you know, others who I think are more campaigning on the question of tenor. We had the tenor wrong. So, you know, are we uh, willing to, you know, admit that we uh, sort of took, took some of the, you know, wrong approach at the leadership level and, you know, are we contrite enough? I don't know really how to phrase that, but there's sort of the they're looking, I, I don't, I'm not going to say they're not going to be serious about policy, we'll wait and see, but I think there's a couple of candidates who've emerged who are talking more about the tenor of how we did things before and we can improve, um, you know, our, our pitch or our tone, if you will. Well, uh, I, I in, find it in interesting. I find it interesting because I was just at the Leela here event last well, day before we recorded this and right. she said that the party made mistakes. It's yeah. very rare for politicians to admit that they've made mistakes. There, there are some who have, I will admit that, that mm -hmm. some say, yes, we, we screwed up on this, so we need to fix it. Stephen Harper did a few times, if I'm not mistaken. But to actually come out and say you've made mistakes, are Albertans and Canadians looking for that? An honest politician? An honest politician who is willing to say, you know what, we screwed up on this one. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna wreck, the, right the ship, and we're gonna go forward together, and we're gonna bring everyone together, and we won't let what, what happened in the past happen again. Well, you're you're talking to a guy who actually believes that that matters. It matters uh, to I, me I, as well, but I'm know, saying the general I, Canadians. I mean, I, do you think I, they matter? Do you think they care? Yeah, I, I do. I think they want. They want to know that people are able to say, I've made a mistake and I know how to course correct. Uh, there is a difference too, though, if I can quibble about the quality of a statement like that, there is a difference between sort of saying generically that we made mistakes and being substantive and in, uh, in more specific about what mistakes we made, um, because that will tell me whether or not you've got the prescription that will solve uh, or address the mistakes, right? So 
I asked I'll, that uh, follow up. I asked that follow up, and I did not get an answer that I wanted. So I'll give I'll give you a good example. So, uh, for example, Danielle Smith has uh, multiple times now on the public record talked about the floor crossing. Uh, it's a big issue. That's one she couldn't run away from, so she had to confront it. But to her credit, um, you know, she's taken it head on. She's had an explanation for it, and 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 an, and an acceptance or taking responsibility for that now people will have to decide whether they think that's that's good enough or not but at least a mea culpa there on a very specific thing with a specific response to it is the kind of things that well i think people will now go kind of, okay well maybe i should you know i you know i appreciate that you know getting a getting a direct answer on it am i now open to listening to the rest of the message uh we'll see how that plays out for uh, danielle um but i you know I, I mean, personally, I've I've been there. Look, I've publicly apologized before when I was a member of parliament. And uh, once during a campaign, I got the record of my opponent wrong. I was running against Susan Whalen at the time uh, for, I think, a second time. Uh, and Essex uh, I, is very weird in that way. You guys like to run against each other like three or four times, don't you? Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I made a mistake about her record publicly. And I, I used an opportunity uh, during election and all candidates made uh, 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 meeting with media present and obviously her present to set the record straight I made a public mistake and I needed to correct the record why because her record mattered to me um, I shouldn't be dishonest about that and so you know I and the people in the room certainly and I think by extension people who heard the apology appreciated it so that was a very specific thing um, can we can we can we see politicians who do that I sure hope so um, that's okay. And there's a willingness to a degree to tolerate some of that. Now, if you chronically make mistakes, uh, then the public are going to question your competency uh, at some point too, and whether you should continue in governing. But, um, but this is an important thing. Um, it's an integrity question. It starts inside. Can I, can I admit when I've, when I've blown it, right? And, and do I trust the public then to digest that? and um, make a decision they are the hiring and firing committee they may decide to fire you on a first offense they could um but i'd rather be i'd rather be clean both in my conscience and clean when i'm dealing with uh the people who delegated their authority to me uh in an election uh about uh, you know about uh, what i may have done wrong so. We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15 second soundbite by becoming a backer of the show. With a quick visit to patreon.com and searching cross-border interviews, you can help continue this show. For as little as $3 a month, your support can ensure we grow and bring new and exciting things to our growing listenership. Click the link in the show notes and back the show today. Do you think the conservative candidates for the leader of the Conservative Party of Canada understand that now? Because they saw oh, what I, happened to Aaron O'Toole and they saw what happened to Andrew Scheer? No clue. I wish I could get inside their heads, but I can't. <laughs> but, but would you hope that they have learned? Because you don't, the the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different Yeah, I, I don't even know if they think about the question of authenticity, right? I mean, there's so much about politics is image um now and you know uh, for you know portraying my best self or portraying their worst self or things like that but um i just my operating system is being authentic i just don't even know how to do it differently i don't have a grid for some of the stuff that goes on in politics but um so you know if i was ever the guy running again in an election i'd have to just authentically be myself um and not what i hope maybe the voters would think I am or something like that, right? So that's just me, that's my grid. And uh, I don't know if it's a universal lesson to learn, but I would hope people would just be themselves. That's the best foot to put forward anyway. Um, you know, I, um, we'll, we'll see where it shakes out. I'm wishing all the candidates good luck, obviously too. This is a tough and grueling thing to engage in. Uh, it's gonna take a lot out of them, I, you know, you know what it's, you know what it's like to kind of throw the hat in the ring and i've been through elections myself so these things are tough i have a lot of respect for people that put their name on the line including for leadership and uh, we're wishing them well we'll see what comes out maybe we'll have a conversation uh, on uh, the flip side someday about what happened 
which I, I will hold you to that, Jeff. I will certainly hold you to that. Um, How about Jeff, the first round? There you go. <laughs> my, my last question to you, Jeff, is this. What's next for you? Former oh politician gosh. looking for life out here in the Great West. What does life okay. for in the conservative movement look like for you, Jeff Watson? Well, I came west for a fresh start after um, after losing in 2015. A large part of that was for my kids' sake. I just wanted them to be judged for uh, who they are and what they do and not their relationship to me. And uh, that's really succeeded for them. I'm watching my family grow. I think that's amazing. Um, you know, I still kibitz around the edges. I do some consulting uh, with political leaders uh, from time to time. Um, you know, I obviously watch what goes on. I do a little bit of organizational politics while I've been in Alberta. Um, but uh, there is life post politics. I'm enjoying it. Um, you know, my family's enjoying it too. The stress and the pressures are different. Um, I always keep in the back of my mind the question of responsibility. Um, will there ever be a need for the experience or not? I'll keep my eye open on that. I, I, I'm never shy about taking on important responsibility. I'm, I'm sober about those things. Um, but I don't know, politics to a degree has carried on well with uh, Jeff Watson. I, maybe they don't need me either. So uh, we'll see. I'll, I'll never say never, but I, I don't have a, a design or a plan in motion to, uh, uh, to, uh, to rejoin politics at this particular point in my life. For now, I'm a, I'm a casual but happy movement conservative cheering the team on. Well, I, I guess I should have said this was my last question. Then I, I should, I'm not a pro, not a proper journalist unless I ask the the, the million dollar question. Okay. Here is, do you have any horses in the races for the leadership of the Conservative Party of Canada and the leadership of the United Conservative Party of Canada? Because you are an Alberta resident. I'm not declared in either at this particular point. The uh, the provincial field is very interesting. I'm gonna I'm I'm waiting to see how it shapes up a little bit more. I think before I make a decision about where to jump on that one. I'm, I'm a little further down the road as I think about my choices in the federal one, but I, I haven't made a, a clear decision yet. My wife and I are still having conversation on that, but uh, keep an eye on my social media. I may make, uh, I may make an announcement in the near future, or maybe I won't. Maybe I'll just decide nobody needs to hear my opinion anyway. I don't know. <laughs> hey, your opinion is much needed in today's wow. conversation. But Appreciate Jeff, it. I want to thank you so much for sitting down and talking to me for the last hour and a bit. Um, I always love having people like yourself who are willing to just have a conversation and just talk about the issues. And it was so informative and so reflective of what's going on today in the conservative movement, but also uh, the conservative party of Canada. So thank you so much for this. You're welcome. Thank you. So with that, I want to remind everyone, this has been the Crossboard Interviews with Chris Brown. Uh, get out from behind social media for at least 10 minutes a day and go have a conversation with somebody. It does help our society when we don't yell at each other on social media. I know it's a weird concept, but stop it. So with that, I want to thank you everyone for tuning in and remind everyone, <laughs> keep talking.